Our Father in heaven, thank you this morning. That, yeah, the old, old story never gets old. So pray you bless your class this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, trust is kind of a choice, right? Is it something you can learn? Yeah. All right. Now, inverse ratios, also known as inverse proportions. Wait a minute. Oh, hold on a second. Is that it? Go back one. Go back one. Hold on a second. A little technical difficulty. Okay. Inverse proportions or the law of inverse ratios. And here's an example. It's kind of wordy. Two quantities are in inverse proportion if one quantity increases in a certain value ratio, certain ratio while the other quantity decreases in the inverse of the ratio. But I like the example. 10 men painted a house in four days. How long will it take 20 men to paint it? Yeah, I tricked you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two days. That's the inverse ratios. Now, we say don't eat supper at night for many, many reasons. You don't want to go to bed with your tummy full, right? Because the uh, gastrointestinal system is still under load. You're still having to work. Stomachs, you know, work. You're working your stomach to death. And there's another reason, too. Because as uh, when you eat, your pancreas makes insulin. And when the insulin level goes up, growth hormone goes inverse ratio down. Every physical law in the body is accompanied by a spiritual law. I'd like to study the inverse ratio of discouragement and trust. As trust goes up, now you may not agree with that, but just, just wait for just a short bit, okay, if you don't agree with that. Now, the thing that's so amazing is God uses discouragement to build trust. trust. That's interesting. Well, can you learn to trust? Mm -hmm. yes. Sister Leah, you want to start? The mother's love represents to the child the love of Christ, and the little ones who trust and obey their mother are learning to trust and obey the Savior. And of course, it begins in the home, but it does not end there. Now, I did not, again, some of these quotes, I'm not quoting the source because I don't want to put their name on here, but I'll quote what they said. Uh, Brother Ryan. There is not one piece of cosmic dust that is outside the scope of God's sovereign providence. You believe that? Yep. Do I serve, not you now, I got this personal experience, do I serve a sovereign God? Yes. In other words, my definition of sovereign, He has an interest in me that is intimate, personal, 24 hours a day, He has an interest in me and in my life. It's a sovereign God. When I just became a Christian and started reading the Bible, I uh, had a friend, his name was Charles, who was a Unitarian minister. He told me that God built the universe, walked away, and it runs under His fixed laws. Today I know that to be deism, right? I didn't know what that was back then. I said, wait a minute here, because I was just now a Christian. He built it, turned around, turned away, walked away, and His laws are running it. I said, that sounds like an absentee landlord. Right. He said, that's what it is. And I said, that's no better than what I was, an atheist. <laughs> and it's not. Is it? I need God. He needs me. And when I see my need, He uses that to teach me to trust. Mm -hmm. Let your faith be like Job's, that you may declare, now oh, wait a minute, can you say that? If you read Job chapter 1, what did he lose? Everything. But he didn't lose his... Because chapter, yeah, chapter 2 is the life. A skin for skin, what will a man give in exchange for his skin? So in chapter 2, it was his, his health. You could almost say life. But the Lord said, don't quite take his life. Take everything. But Job didn't even care whether or not his life was going to be taken after. Now, he didn't say it until Job 13. <laughs> But somebody will read 1 and 2, and they'll make an argument that Job, if it had come down to his life, he'd have sold out and cursed God to his face. That's what the devil would have said. 
But you read chapters 3 through 12, and it's like an introduction to chapter 13. And on 13, Job says it. My life means nothing to me. I trust in God. Though he slay me, I'll what? Trust him. Now, how do you get that kind of trust? Ah, the answer is coming. Yeah, let your faith be like Job's that you may say, you may declare, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Lay hold on the promises of your heavenly father. Remember, this is how you get it. Remember his former dealings with you and with his servants. For look at how he dealt with you in the past and see that what you saw, thought was such a terrible blow turned out to be a great blessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember I left Wildwood Hospital. I thought, when I, when I, as I drove out of the gate in 1996, I said, man, those have been the, the hardest three and a half years of my life. Mm-hmm. And they've been the best. <laughs> how can it be? That's retrospect in action. Brother Oliver. He who was wise in counsel is waiting for you all to see your need of help, and it is abundantly provided. It is waiting for you. The pure in heart shall see God, as a present help in every time of need, his present is revealed. Now, now see where I underlined it, it is waiting for you. What is it? Pronoun referring to? Help. 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 It's, it, it's waiting for you. It's, you're not waiting for it. No. He's waiting for you. But you don't see your need, so you don't ask for help, so you don't get it. So God said, i got to do something to help this man. He's got to give some trust because we don't feel our need. When human strength fails, ah, then what? Men feel their need of divine help. Mm -hmm. David seemed to be cut off from every human support. Did allow God for David to be cut off from every support. Yeah. And then what did he say when he finally got to that point? Psalms 56 verse 3. Some trust in, some trust in horses, but we will remember in the Lord. That's not, no, that's Psalms whatever. No, no, no. What time I'm afraid, then will I trust in thee. That's right. You got me all mixed up here. David wrote both of them though. David seemed to be cut off from every human support. All that he held dear on earth had been swept away. Fear and weakness reveal our need for God. And when you see your need, well, I've been waiting for you. I see her. He's always been there. Psalms 56, 3. Yeah. Now, Sister Barbara. So David himself could not discern a way out of the difficulty. God could see it and would teach him what to do. Now we bring Psalms 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember Psalms 20, verse 7, the name of the Lord. God could see it, and he would teach him what to do. I don't see it, but God sees it. He will teach me what to do. Mm-hmm. Go and I will be with thy mouth, and I will teach you what to say, Exodus 4, 12. Now, this is, what's this a picture of anyway? That's a picture of uh, Matthew 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for one farthing? Verse 31, one, one sparrow falls and what? God knows all about it. Mm-hmm. Aren't you worth more than... Now, the verse in the middle, verse 30. Even the hairs are numbered. Now, if that's true, does God know how many hairs I have on my head? Yeah. If that's true and I scratch my head and one falls out, does he know how many hairs I have on my head? Yeah. He could not do that unless he's always got a count, right? Yeah. It's a 24 hours a day, seven day a week count. You call heaven, you don't get an answering machine. You can't, it, it's impossible unless God is always what? Listening. You sleep, God doesn't. You don't think about him, he thinks about you. No, there's the verse. Uh, I'll read this one, it's so short. But the very hairs of your head are all. He doesn't say numbered, it says all numbered, every single one. One fell out, God said, I know about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I like to, from the Bible, discern what God is thinking about at this moment. Can you do that? Oh, yes. At this very moment, in the year, whatever the year is, 2021, 20, what is God thinking about? Not only that. How many thoughts, what the number of thoughts he had on that subject? You can't do that. Yes, you can. Sure you can. Now you got to go into King David again, right? You got to take Psalms 139 and put it with Psalms 40. And I did. And you get not just what he's thinking about, but how many times he's thought about it. Now, uh, Sister Renee, you're going to read the top. How precious also are thy, 
thoughts of unto me, O oh God, how great is the sum of them. And somebody's thinking, well, that doesn't tell us how many. That just says there's a great sum. He's thinking about me. No, 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 no. But you got to put a line upon line, precept upon precept. Now, Miss Renee, the bottom. If I should count them, that they are more in number than the, the sand, when I awake and still with the Okay, that's greater than the sand, but it doesn't tell you how many. Sister, Bar uh, Sister Nicole. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us, Lord. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. Pause. There's only one number that can't be reckoned up. Infinity. Infinity. That's the only number that can't. You give me enough time, I can reckon up any number. It might take a while, but you cannot reckon up infinity. How many thoughts has he had of me? Infinity. That means he has never ceased to think about me. Amen. Now, Amen. I found a statement that said that, by the way. It's right there, but I'm not going to read it yet. I finally found a statement that said, God has never ceased to think about me from the moment he was cre wasn't created. From everlasting Zero to everlasting, blessing. he's thinking about me. Do I need to worry today? No. No. Well, then why do I? Ah, yeah, we're getting, yeah, now we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sister Nicole from the top again. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. That's it. Now, mm -hmm. God's children? No. Mm. Never. Now, God is absent from my mind from time to time. Mm -hmm. But constant contact, He's never absent. Mm -hmm. We are not constant. He is. Amen. He is. And then, uh, and yeah, can I explain this? No. I'm going to read it. I can't explain it. With searching glance, Christ takes in Psalm, John, there's all over the Bible, John 1, 47, it has Nathaniel, and then it was Zorah light indeed, and whom there's no guile. I saw you under the fig tree, I also saw you at the end, and in the beginning, not just the fig tree. While searching, with searching glance, Christ takes in the scene before him as he stands upon the steps of the temple court. With prophetic eye, he looks into whatever futurity is. <laughs> what is that? That's just like everything and sees not only years but centuries and ages now I heard a seven-day Adventist take hold of that and they said oh God lives in the fifth dimension that's like a cockroach trying to explain the uh, gra field gravity field <laughs> you know God lives in the what's that mean God lives in the fifth dimension you're trying to explain how God can see the future oh well he he's already lived the future what do you mean <laughs> You come up with all these ideas to try to explain that. No, God sees everything. How? I don't know. I don't know. Now, don't read the next one, but when you see the picture, you tell me what it is. A, tell me the picture is a picture of what? Don't read it. This is a picture of? Invisible man. What? It's an invisible man. How can you tell me it's an invisible man if he's invisible? <laughs> No, go on. He's invisible. How can you tell me he's an invisible man? While I look not at the things which are seen, but at what? The How can you look at that which is not seen? Yes. <laughs> For the things which we see are temporary, temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Eternal. God. And the reason I know that's an invisible man, the shades gave him away. I see evidence, evidence that there's an invisible God. Haven't seen him, but I've seen evidence. It's uh, back to the thing behind the curtain, right? I know God's back there. Have I seen him? No. But from time to time, the curtain ruffles. Somebody but has got to be back there. And every now and then, the long arm of the Lord reaches out from behind that curtain and does something in my life. Amen. And I say, that was a... That was a... Miracle. Divine uh -huh. appointment. That was a miracle or divine appointment or providence. providence. That, yeah, that was it. Have you ever had one of those? Yes. Come on. Yeah, you ever had one? If you haven't had one, well, you need one. <laughs> Keeps you going. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to spend a few minutes on that. And then uh, Butler Creek. 
who sent, yeah, I'm going to go repeat a thing or two. Who sent Joseph down to Egypt? And don't you say his brothers. God. God. How could it be? I can't explain it. <laughs> Can you? You saw the big picture even before. Yeah. All right. Brother, these wicked brothers, were those wicked brothers? You know, throw Joseph in the pit, sell him to his Ishmaelite cousins down to Egypt as a slave. We'll never see that guy again, right? Did God use those wicked actions to bring about righteousness? Yeah. You're telling me God uses unrighteousness to bring about righteousness? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we read this, I think, about a month ago, right? Sister Leah. Joseph's brethren purposed to kill him, but were finally content to sell him as a slave to prevent his becoming greater than themselves. Pause. Mm -hmm. The brothers could not see the bigger, bigger picture. Can you? No. <laughs> Go ahead. They thought they had placed him where, where there would be no more trouble with his dreams and where, they would, and where there would not be a possibility of their fulfillment. But the very course which they pursued, God overruled to bring about that which they designed never should take place, that he should have dominion over them. And I, I don't, love this. Yeah, oh, I love this. Is, God I, is just amazing. I love it. I love this. <laughs> it doesn't matter what now, happens in my life, he can overrule. That's it. How, and this, how does he do that? Don't know. But do you believe he does? Yes. Well, then why? All right. Now, I don't want to put words in God's mouth. But maybe the Lord's thinking, I need to teach Joseph a little bit more about what? I was going to say trust. Same thing, right? And it came to pass about this time. Oh, Joseph went to the house. Who was in there? Potiphar's wife. And that was all. She saw Joseph. Joseph saw her. She said, come and lie with me. Right? Now, is Joseph, is Joseph about to go to the pokey? Yes. And Sister Lacole, you're read. And she Caught him by his garment. garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Now, was God's purpose being fulfilled by Potiphar's wife? Yes. yes. Was Joseph doing righteous actions? Yes. yes. God used unrighteous action and righteous. righteous action to bring His purposes to pass. You can't do anything for or against God. Hey, Romans 8, 31 of God's for us. Who can be against us? Righteous, unrighteous? God didn't care. I use that. I use this. I use everything. Mm -hmm. And then as Joseph's uh, master took him, put him into prison. Uh, put, now, here's the important part. Joseph is now in the penitentiary. Is God with him every step of the way? Yes. Can Joseph see it? No. no. Yes. He can trust that he is, but he may not see it. Can Joseph clearly discern God's leading in his life? No. Beat me up, threw me in the pit, now I'm going to jail for doing the right thing. No. Uh, I couldn't say for sure, but it, wouldn't, it would appear Joseph might not be seeing clearly the leading hand of God. So if you can't see it, you got to what? Sure. That's it. That's the class this morning place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in the prison. Now, there are many, many, and Mrs. White calls them like John Baptist going to the dungeon of dark providence. There are many of those in the Bible. Many are not explained. But this one is. But you got to remember, now we see through a glass how? Yeah. It's like a, I can't quite make it out. But then I'm going to see how? Now I know how, but then I shall know, even as I am known. I can't see it now, but when I get there, looking back, I'm going to say what? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It was good. But as you walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and not by sight, you can only walk if you what? Trust God. Now Joseph can't see it, but he could say, I know somehow this is working for my good. Right. <laughs> he could. What I need is a time machine. Then I could go forward, see my life, come, come back, back and live it, and then I know everything's working out for good. Mm -hmm. My dear friends, the last thing in the world you need is a time machine. Mm -hmm. Brother Oliver, you want to read? This is Noble Alexander. Uh, when he's in the penal colony, he's, he's going in, thinks he's going to be there for five days. Just how long will they keep me here? I wonder. This was February 20, 1962. Fortunately, I didn't know that I would remain a captive in Castro's awful prison system for 22 years. 22 years. Yeah, Sister Renee and I read that book not long ago, didn't we? Yes, sir. If you're going to be locked up and tortured for 22 years, do you want to know it in advance? Yeah. Mm. I don't think so. 
I don't want to know. If I'm going to get hit by a bulldozer on my way home today, do I want to know right now? Let my last hour be a happy one. I don't want to know. By the way, you don't need to know. <laughs> if you did, God would tell you. We may rejoice at all which has perplexed us, and I am perplexed by some of the things happening to me right now. Can't see the wisdom in it. In the providences of God will then be made plain. Things hard to be understood will then find explanation. And where our finite minds discovered only confused and broken promises. Now remember Romans 8, 28, and we know all things work together. You've got to know. We shall see the most perfect and beautiful harmony. Why? Because now we see through glass darkly. But then, face to face with Christ, He'll explain it. We'll say, wouldn't change the thing. Ezekiel saw confusion. Yeah, Ezekiel saw confusion. And Daniel told Ezekiel, the Lord removes kings and He sets them up. <laughs> right? He is on top of things. I see confusion. Well, all the time, some things look confusing to me. But above the distractions of the earth, who sits in throne? Come on. And now from his great and calm eternity, back up. All things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he does what? Orders that which his providence sees as best. <laughs> wow. Let me rephrase that. God at work in my life. Now, if I could just believe this, ah, oh, if I could just believe this, wouldn't that change my life? Yes. Now, why in the world did God let Joseph pass through all these things? Because they tortured him into prison. Oh, yeah, they tortured him. God could have overruled and saved Joseph from the torture. It's true, he could have. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet... <clears throat> They hurt with fetters. He was laid in the iron until the time the Lord came. Why couldn't the Lord come a little quicker? <laughs> and then uh, the next two, three verses explain why. A lot, of, a lot of it is not explained in the Bible. This one is. This, of course, is... Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a cold place, right? Now they got on these, uh, what, do, what do you call them? These uh, uh, leper skin boots? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What are they wearing on their feet? Uh, okay, if you never knew, that's what they're wearing. Those are shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, they were made by the shoemaker there, who was tried after the war, uh, uh, convicted as a Nazi war criminal and put in jail. They gave him his uniform, then they gave him his shoes. shoes. Guess what kind of shoes they gave him? The ones he made. And the record is, he put them on, took a few steps, and he said, if I had known, I would never have made them. Mm -hmm. And before God gave Joseph power to uh, do anything he wanted to the people in Egypt, he gave Joseph a lesson on how it would feel. Mm -hmm. That is how God works. And that's the last part of our class. Before God... Yeah, yeah, we'll finish the sentence in a minute. So, Brother uh, Ryan. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his sons his wisdom. Before you bind anybody up, we're going to bind, bind you up. up and let you see how it feels. You say, well, my mother was a devil-possessed parent. God's trying to show you how not to be. I, my teacher was just cruel and mean. Uh, good. Maybe you got some lessons on how not to be a cruel and mean teacher if God calls you to do that. Every experience in your life ordered as his providence sees best. Now, Jacob, their father, said, of course, you know the story, right? Joseph went down. Uh, came the uh, starvation and, and the, the drought. The brothers go down. They, uh, they bring back the corn. Uh, Joseph keeps Benjamin. Uh, they say, if you want to see Benjamin again, you need to bring back. I'm sorry, he kept Simeon. If you want to see, I'm sorry, he kept Judah. Judah. Was it Judah? Who was it? No. Judah wanted to say Simeon. Simeon. 
And then tell them go for Joseph. Go bring Joseph, uh, bring Benjamin back, or you'll never see him again, or something. So they go back, try to get uh, Jacob to give uh, Benjamin. That's the setting. And so they go back, and Jacob sees him coming. One missing, Simeon, and they say, "If you want to see Simeon, now we got to take." Me, you have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. Simeon is not. Now you want to do what? <sighs> and then what did that man say? Last part. All these things are against me. Was Jacob blind? Mm -hmm. Are we? Yes. It all looked like it was okay. against him. But absolutely everything was no. for him. But how, how do you... How do you... How do you, in that moment, make a decision to be like... Because that is what you see. That's what you see. Taking your, he took his three sons. Now we look not at the things which are seen. So, you're saying that I actually need to accept everything that happens in my life once I give myself to God as a part of His divine purpose. No, Romans 8, 28 says that God said it, not me. All things. Okay. Everything. I mean, my, I almost I got broke my ribs and my back and what I did. I could, it's hard to sleep at night. And that's working for my good. Now, I don't know how. In retrospect, ask me later, I can tell you. Uh, but I know if God's for me, who can be against me? Now, you take this and you put it with this. Those who look on outward appearance, or the physical are not good judges of what God is doing. They are not happy. They see failure where there is victory, a great loss where there is gain, and like Jacob, they are ready to say what? Oh, Man, it's all working against me. When the things they complain about are all working together for their good. Ah, oh, wow, what a sentence. And that is a picture of a jetway in Detroit. And I was... Uh, Getting on a plane, I was going from uh, Nashville to Detroit to Paris to Kiev, and uh, if I was late in the Ukraine, I would miss the pickup, and I'd have to get myself across the country on a bus, and I thought, oh Lord, help me to be on time. <laughs> I got to Detroit, so far so good, got on the plane, and I thought, praise the Lord, I'm on time. I saw a maintenance man go into the Delta bathroom and come out. And that's okay, too. Went back in, came out, repetition's okay. Went back in, came out, and I thought something's wrong with the toilet. And I thought... <laughs> that thought was just, just here, just a little bit. And then uh, the pilot said, an announcement, we've resolved our maintenance issue in the lavatory we're going to get out of here on time. <laughs> Praise <laughs> the Lord. It's all working for me. And then out of my window, I see these dark clouds rolling in very quickly to the Detroit airport. And I thought, yeah, this is, they, they fly in rain. Don't think I'm a barber. They fly in rain. And no problem. Lightning started coming. Lightning hit. And then lightning, you could hear the thunder and the clap. And then the pilot came on and he said, we've got a small problem. The man that runs the jetway left and he said he's not coming back until the lightning storm's over <laughs> and he said well we don't need that to fly to fly to he said the jetway is to be withdrawn from the uh, plane and he's the only one that can do it <laughs> i said all these things are Thank you. I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, man, this is against me. It's all against me. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got to where I was going, and my roommate you was a bus. No, I barely, ma I barely made it in Paris. The, my roommate was a pastor, and uh, American. And I said, Boy, coming over here, man, I had, I had a time. And he said, I did too. He said, well, I had some experience. He said, I did too. <laughs> he said, I left my flight. My flight left Chattanooga. I was flying to Detroit. And before I even landed, I could see my flight was already going to be gone. And I was thinking, I'm not going to make it here. I'm going to have to catch a bus all the way across the country. I said, uh, you went to Detroit? Then where? Paris? I said, what flight were you on? He gave me his boarding pass. This is gospel truth. And I said, when you landed, your flight was still there, wasn't it? 
I said, yeah. I said, God broke the toilet, and he sent lightning. <laughs> <laughs> All these things were working? Yeah, I couldn't believe He couldn't either. I showed you he couldn't believe the thing. And it was all working for good. While Satan is constantly devising evil, the Lord our God overrules all. all so that it will not harm his obedient, trusting. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> trusting children. The same power that controls the boisterous ways of the ocean can hold in check all the power of rebellion and of crime. 439 of Mark, peace be still. Now, David chased for years by Saul. And after a while, David was no longer walking by faith. He said to himself, I'll never what? I'll never be the next king. I will never make it. The problem with that, you are underestimating the power of Sister Nicole, God. David's conclusion that Saul would certainly accomplish his murderous purpose was formed without the counsel of God. Mm. Even while Saul was plotting and seeking to accomplish his destruction, the Lord was working to secure David the kingdom. God works out his plans, though to human eyes they are veiled in mystery. Mm. Men cannot understand the ways of God, and looking at appearances they interpret the trials and tests and provings that God permits to come upon them as things that are against them and that will only work their ruin. Thus David looked on appearances and not at the... Yeah, if you can believe this, not at the... Promises of God. He doubted that he would ever come to the throne. Long trials had wearied his faith and exhausted his patience. Case closed. So I think I've told you this before. It's Henry Zeze will, right? Well, you know, he's asking for some help. Got constipation. Don't have time for him. Mm -hmm. And there was old Henry, right? Got past the constipation. And I got the uh, Anopheles mosquito bit me my last night in West Africa. I got uh, falcipra malaria. And I had this constipation that was killing me. And all I could think about laying in that bed was Henry Zeze. Well, and God said to me, you're going to learn one way. You're going to learn the easy way. But you're going to learn. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, you're going to learn. Above the distractions of the earth, God sits enthroned. All things are up to His divine survey. He orders from his, uh, and from His great calm eternity. He orders that which His providence sees as best. Sister Barbara, there it is. In His providence, God brings people into different positions, places, and circumstances that they may discover the, de the, de the defects that are concealed from their mm -hmm. own knowledge. Now, not only was Joseph getting some help, he was helping his brothers and his father Jacob. I mean, where everybody's winning, when God gets into the game, everybody wins, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is one that I was thinking about some experiences of mine. This is when the Darlene and I just first met. She said, we gotta go see the wild horses on Cumberland Island National Seashore. I said, well, okay, let's go. So we packed up our organic pot, maybe a little liquor, I don't know what we were carrying, got down there, Darlene was in home all the time, I was sitting here. We had a certain lingo we spoke back then. Uh, uh, Oliver won't understand what I'm about to say. Oh man, uptight, out of sight, peace, gravity, peace, and salutations to all the world. <laughs> this is how we talk. This is how we talk. Right? That's how we talk. You know, no, no cross earring hanging down on my ear, <laughs> my hair up like here, yeah, man. <laughs> this is how it was. And I saw these trees from, oh man, groovy, out of sight. Look at that. <laughs> and then uh, I thought, That's, what is that anyway? What is that? What is it? It's trees. Oh, it's trees. That's just a bunch of trees. And I walked down as a 22-year-old or 23-year-old nut. I walked down, turned left. And that mess had turned into absolute perfect what? Order. What changed? Your perspective. perspective. Yes, my perspective changed. Your life, from your perspective, looks like confusion. There's the pie. God, well, you see one thin slice of the pie from one angle. God sees the pot. How much of the pie does he see? Play. The whole pie from the top, bottom, inside, outside. He sees everything. Our perspective is absolutely limited. And that's the lesson I got when I was just a, I was just a kid. <laughs> By the way, let me define the word invincible. That means incapable of failure. You can't fail. You can't. But you notice now, first step, feel your need. Second step, exercise trust. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Oliver. Do I patiently to trust 
when everything looks dark, is a lesson that the leaders in God's work need to learn. Heaven will not fail them in their day of adversity. Amen. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invinci invincible than the soul that feels nothing, nothingness and relies wholly on God. That's it. I'm leaning hard on the Almighty Arm today. Oh Lord, we gotta have some we gotta have some countertops in there for the girl coming to run to school. Got a lady coming up to, to work in our school. This is five, six, seven years ago. Her name was Charlene. We were going to build an apartment down there, and so we got to have some countertops. And so, uh, mission story to the far country of Orlando. This lady came to our program. Her husband dropped her off. His name was Jim. She was here for 28 days, lose weight, came back. And Jim was a cabinet maker. He came back, picked up his wife. She was under the persimmon tree. Jim said, uh, how you doing? Gave me a hug, shook hands, shot the breeze. He says, my wife around, she's right there, looked under the persimmon tree. I don't see her. Then she's right under the tree. I don't see her. Only nobody under the tree but her. I said, that's your wife. He said, uh, don't see her. I said, that's your wife. She turned around and said, that's my wife? <laughs> yeah. Jim said, I want to give you some cabinets. <laughs> He said, if you ever have it, when you get this, we were just building it. When this place is finished over here, I'll come up, put the cabinets in. You got to pay for the materials, but I'll do the labor free, build them free professional job. How much will the materials cost, Jim? $32,000. Mm, never going to call what? him. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be cabinets everywhere. Okay, it's okay. And so Charlene was coming. We didn't have any cabinets in the apartment there. And I said, Lord, we need some cabinets. I wrote Jim and I called him and I said, Look, do you have like damaged seconds? <laughs> he might want to, you're trying to get rid of them, buy any cabinets. And he said, Well, let me, uh, yeah. he said, No, we don't do seconds, we don't have damaged things. It's all first class. Now, is this thing dated? It's not, the date's not on it. Lou, God's timing is always good. I woke up, got this email from Jim. As promised, I made a phone call this morning. I was told the cabinets in these pictures are coming out soon. I can have them if I want them, so I guess my question for you is, do you want them? I will keep you informed as I learn more about the timing. You want to see the pictures they sent me? They were a walnut, uh, walnut cabinets in a mansion in Orlando, Florida. And not only were they given the cabinets, they gave the appliances too. I wrote Jim back and said, yes! I wrote Steve. I, I called Steve. I said, "Brother, get on your traveling shoes." I rented a U-Haul. We drove down to Orlando. Steve and I brought all those cabinets back. This is a miracle you can verify because those cabinets. See, oh, see the white painting on the stripes. Those cabinets are in that kitchen down there. And I said, "Well, what I should have said is, God still had how many more, more, more ways, Sister Barbara? You want to read how, how many, how many more? He still had a thousand more, of which I still knew. Keep reading now. Go ahead. Our heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us, which we know nothing. Those, those who accept the one principle of making the service of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. God's got to be six thirty three, number uno, right? He's got to be number one. Now. Uh, one more. <laughs> I know, I, I know. I'm, I'm full of repetition this morning. I'm sorry. I was going from Paris to Atlanta. Darlene was picking me up at Atlanta Airport. I got something like ty typhoid fever or something in, uh, in Guinea, West Africa. I made Mark Coleman, the AFM pastor, promise me if I was even drawing one breath, he'd put me on that plane. I don't want to die in Guinea. This is not the malaria. This is a different time. I got on the plane eight hours to Paris. I was in that airport six, seven, eight hours. Got on the flight ten hours to Atlanta. I'm going down. And as we get just uh, coming down, you know, the seaboard to east, the pilot says, you may have noticed we've changed direction. Don't worry. There's no problem with the plane. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did he say? Everybody said, what did he say? Five minutes later, the flight attendants will no longer serve alcohol. What did he say? Five minutes later, we're going north to St. John's, Canada. What did he say? Five minutes later, all of U.S. airspace is closed. <laughs> and you had a plane full of people, I don't know, 300 people, sweating. 
Now, what would you conclude if that's what you'd heard? Because when he said the last thing, that ruled out hijack. Because you don't close the whole country for a hijacking. Some kind of war. Something's happening. And so this is a picture they took. Because they landed about got like 75 747s and 77 7s on a runway that hold about four. <laughs> <laughs> they had them lined up and stacked up. Here's another picture. They, put, they rerouted the two airports in Canada. They had the whole place filled with planes. Next question. When you got that many people, thousands of people on planes, and they got, they got room enough to process maybe 10 people through customs, what do the people do sitting on the planes? They sit. And they wouldn't let anybody off the plane. And I sat again on that plane for I think eight more hours. You know how many hours that is? I was sick as a dog. Eight, 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 eight. Don't tell me this is working for my good. It sure is. It sure is. It sure is. <laughs> I was just praying to get off that plane. I said, Lord, the moment I get onto that runway, I'm going to lay down and die. <laughs> and I couldn't die in the seat. And they let me off. By the way, in, uh, in, re in remembrance of the, you know, it was, there, yeah, by the people so nice here. Got off the plane, laid down on the tarmac, and I thought I was going to die. Anyway, they ended up taking us on buses. This is where they took me. This is St. John's University. And that's the bell tower outside where I was staying. I was staying in the basement, sleeping on a cot that smelled like mothballs, wool blankets. It was horrible. I was sweating and shivering and shaking and just miserable. And Darlene didn't know where I was because they weren't, you know, airlines were all confusion. I got, they let us make a call the next day. I called, uh, I called Darlene, and by the way, I bet nobody in the room under, remembers when the nine, now I'm not, God did not do anything. Don't blame God for these things. God uses these wicked men. He uses what they do. 9-11 happened on what day of the week? Anybody remember? It was Tuesday. It was Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh yeah. Just had yeah. Tuesday. Yeah, it was on a Tuesday. Because what I'm going to say, if it had been on Monday, this wouldn't have worked. God had my head numbered. They gave me a phone call. Darling answered, Hello, honey, I'm alive. Praise <laughs> Here, she's so happy. And I said, I'm sick. And I'm, they say that we're going to leave any minute. I'm coming right back home. I was sitting there five more days. And now I woke up. It was Wednesday. I'm in St. John's, didn't know anybody, first time I'd ever been there, sick as a dog. What would you do? Now it's what day? Wednesday. What would you do? Got the telephone book. Opened up. C. Churches. Right. Seventh-day Adventist. One. Called the number. Woman answered. Hello? I said, ma'am, is this the Seventh-day Adventist church? She says, not exactly. She said, my husband's the first elder. Ah, I said, I'm one of these thousands of people that stuck here in the airport. Can you, uh, can you ask your husband if I can come to church tonight? She said, you can come to church. She said, where are you at? I said, I'm in the, uh, the basement here the, the St. John's. Do you know where the bell tower is? Oh, yeah, it's right outside my door. She said, you be there, quarter will seven. My husband will come by and pick you up. By the way, the way they resolved this immigration issue and all this, they said, come off the plane with only what you're wearing, and that's it. Don't bring anything off that plane with what you're wearing. So now, I'd already been maybe 30 hours sitting and sweating and I was sick. I hadn't changed clothes or had a shower in two days, three days. I look rough, I smelled rough. <laughs> I'm sitting by the bell tower and this Adventist guy pulls up, opens the window, does this. <laughs> I know what he's thinking. I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I know, I know, this, I know it's terrible, <laughs> but I'm him. <laughs> I'm the seventh day Adventist. Yeah. He said, hop in the car. <laughs> he probably wouldn't put a towel in or something. I got in and went to the church. He said, where are you coming from? I said, Guinea, West Africa. What are you doing there? Working with Muslims. They just found out some of these terrorist hijacker things. They were figuring some things out. He said, would you uh, like to do the prayer meeting tonight? I said, sure. So I got up and I apologized the way I looked, the way I smelled. Told him what I've been doing, gave him the story, a little of my testimony worked in. I sat down, sat down in the pew, got a tap on my shoulder, got handed a piece of paper. It said, Dear Brother Lou, 
would you please, I don't have that, I've got, the, I've got the rest, but I don't have this one. Would you please come to our house tonight? We'll make you a, a nice hot supper, warm bed, wash your clothes, da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. Your brother Michael. Back, here's a guy on the back row. <laughs> and of course, they told us there, you can't leave and leave the, the dorm. I suppose you need to leave. And I said, like, I can't. The flight, flight's going to leave any minute. I got to get back. And then I said, but this means so much to me. He went into his wallet, pulled out his card, stuck it in my pocket. He said, if ever you're in St. John, you got a rain check. And I said, thank you, brother. I got in the car. He's taking me back. First elder's taking me back to the, to the place. And I said, that guy Michael is a really nice guy. He said, well, he's having some real problems in the church. He's got some, uh, he's basically out of the church. There's some real conflict issues there between him and the leadership. And it's just it's a, not a good situation. It's okay. Three days later, I came home. I'd worked at Wildwood Hospital. I had people, my family there, my secretary, Bessie Callahan. I walked into her office. Bessie! She got her magnifying glasses, 80 something, Matt glasses, magnifying glasses. Sister Bessie looked at me, didn't even pay me no attention. I said, I'm back! Because I knew where I was sick and everything. She walked over to me, got right in my face with her glasses, and she said, Well, well, she said, Was it a providence? Yeah, I said, Yeah, it was. I ran home. I had not washed that shirt where he put his card in it. Boom. So I took that card out and I had on my computer three sermons from WD for Z, how to relate to church leadership. One was called The Church Our Mother. Another was called, I don't remember the names, but it was about faithfulness to the leadership in the church. I put them on a CD, sent it to, I think it was his business address, sent it to his office. And I got this email, October 25, 2001. Subject, thank you so much. Dear Brother Lou, yesterday, October 24, 2001, I received your letter in the company CD with the three sermons by Elder W. Frizzee. I have read all three and I have found them to be a blessing. I thank the Lord for His impressions upon your heart to send these to me as I am in need of them. I am once again shown that Jesus loves and cares for me in ways I cannot yet understand. I will pray that your thoughts and prayers for me will be evidenced in my applying the many things that I have read in these sermons to my life. Namely, I need to see Christ's church, His children, and myself through His eyes and only His eyes. And the only way I can do that is through His prescription, a quiet place for prayer and study. I must go now. Thank you again for your thoughts and prayers. Little do we know sometimes how the Lord impresses others on our behalf. Remember, the next time you find yourself in the area, our area of the invitation still stands. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me how 23-year-old hippie on Cumberland Island with all those wild horses, right? <laughs> Some old pot-smoking, half-crazy criminal on this, on this wild horse island, God was going to take that insane man and get him to Canada to meet a guy named Michael Young 20 years down the road. How did God do that? How did God take me off to Harley and put me inside that church to meet Michael Young so I could give him something? And it wasn't mine. It was W.D. for Z's to give him something I had on my computer for 10 years to turn that man's life around. How did God do that? As His providence sees His best. Mm -hmm. And so when I got this, uh, I was reading this uh, along there somewhere. Go ahead, Brother Ryan. But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. And then on July, Jim, the cabinet man, sent me an email. The smoke had cleared. We had the cabinets. Out of nowhere, he sent me this email. 2011, July 8. Hi, Lou. Um, the first part was just niceties. Remember the miracle is in the timing. We don't often see such nice cabinets being replaced. They were taking out new cabinets to put in new cabinets. He said, I've never seen it before. You sent a request that I see what I could find. I called our project manager the next morning. He happened to have this kitchen coming available in a few days. The miracle is in the timing. Jim said, I've never seen it before. 
You may never see it again. God has how many ways? A thousand. I took this picture in Turkey. This was a rug shop, handmade Persian carpets. This man tried to sell me that for $3,000. I said, this is an American that is poor. He would not <laughs> believe me. I ended up giving him a chair massage. He wouldn't, he wouldn't buy into it that I was broke. Well, I had an experience in that shop. This is one I did not have. This is a Baptist named Hannah Bolt Moore. It's a famous story. She went into a place where they were manufacturing carpets. She looked at one of the carpets and said, there's no beauty there. The merchant said, it's one of the most beautiful carpets you've ever seen. Mrs. Moore replied, why, here's a piece hanging out and it is all in disorder. His answer was what? The problem is, it's our perspective. It's all bent up backwards from sin. If you could ever get a mind like God, you'd see everything he does is righteous and good. But praise the Lord, we will be able to see it and say, I would not have wanted it any other way. And I can't explain that now, but uh, I guess I can explain it then. I'll pray. By the way, when that, when that, when that, uh, when that, when that little, now we see through glass, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now I see, we th I said now and then, now we see through glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know as I am known. Now abides Faith, hope, and charity. But the greater charity. Charity. Slash love, same thing. Yeah, that's going to get us through. Our Father in heaven, thank you for a, a reminder this morning that you're on the throne. You're ordering that which your providence sees as best. Your children are never absent from your mind. The hairs on my head, or you've got them numbered down in your mind. You've never stopped thinking about me from infinite ages even until now. What do I need to worry about? Why do I need to fret? Lord, have mercy and help me to trust. And I ask the same for my friends. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.